Yo, what up, everybody? Another year in the books. Thank you all so much for tuning into the podcast this year. It's been such a great year for the show, for the community. Uh, awesome, awesome participation from you guys. Got the happy hours. I really appreciate it. All of you guys being there and just excellent, uh, you know, excellent listenership, man. You guys are you guys are the best listeners in the world. I don't know if anybody's told you that today, but you are the best listener. Love you guys. Thank you so much for your support. So. Uh, This year, we celebrated a lot of milestones, right? There's the one-year anniversary. We crossed 100 episodes. We crossed 200 episodes, crossed 100,000 downloads. Thank you all so much for the support. Literally could not have done it without you. So thank you guys so, so much. Uh, You guys are the reason why I keep creating this thing. Just wanted to quickly share uh, some insights from Spotify's 2021 Unwrapped. And if you haven't already, uh, and you're listening to this on Spotify, you can now rate the show on Spotify. So do me a favor. If you enjoyed everything you're listening to this year, go ahead and tap five stars on Spotify. If you got the Spotify unwrapped yourself, go ahead and post it on social media. Tag me on Twitter at Data Science Harp. Tag me on Instagram at Data Science Harp. Tag me on LinkedIn, man. If you guys have me in your Spotify unwrapped, go ahead and let me know, man. Uh, you know, I, I don't feel like I get a chance to connect with with uh, with enough of you. I know there's a small group that connect with with the uh, with the happy hours, but would love to be in touch with more of you guys. This year, we kicked off an episode on January 1st featuring Kate Strachany. Uh, a total of 118 episodes were uh, released in this year alone. Eight new countries started streaming the show. The most spins from these new countries coming from El Salvador, Algeria, Nigeria, the Czech Republic, and Azerbaijan. John, that's nuts to me. That's totally wild. Look, if you're one of the folks tuning in from there, send me an email. I would love to get to know you guys better. Uh, but yeah, a total of 18 countries out there listening to the show. I think that's that's amazing. The most internationally listened to episode was the one I released with Sundas Khalid. That was on January 15th, titled Be Remarkable. So if you haven't checked that out, go and listen to that. Followers increased by 133%. So this is awesome. I'd love to get a chance to uh, learn more about you guys and and, you know, send me an email. You guys know my email. It's the arts of data science at gmail.com. Uh, number of hours increased. There's a 78% increase in hours listened from last year. Probably a function of me just pushing content out there, uh, pushing a lot of content out there. 107 of you listen to my podcast more than any other podcast. So if that's you, I want to hear from you, all 107 of you who listen to this podcast more than any other podcast. If you're listening right now, let me know. Screenshot that bit from your Spotify year unwrapped and and send it to me, man. I want to see it. Uh, 13 of you guys listened to me on your birthday. So happy birthday to you guys. How dope is that, right? I'm super happy for you. Super proud of all of you guys. Uh, thank you again for just being such awesome listeners of the show. Hope you guys have a great holiday season i hope you guys really enjoy the new year i can't wait to hear about all the awesome stuff you'll be doing next year so i thank you again my friends and listen to the rest of this episode we're going to recap some of the biggest uh hits from this year so stay tuned my friends as usual remember you've got one life on this planet why not try to do some big cheers everyone So please help me in welcoming our guest today, the man who organizations call when they want to protect themselves from cyber criminals, Christian Espinosa. Christian, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to come on to the show, man. Appreciate having you here. Yeah, thank you, Harpreet. I appreciate the uh, the nice introduction there. It's awesome. That's absolutely my pleasure, man. I would agree, agree that uh, a lot of people that say they're the smartest person in the room, they're 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 limiting their belief to just being smart about one particular topic. Uh, and that's where the fixed mindset comes into play. Because if you have the growth mindset, you 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 might say, you know what, I, I'm not too good with people, but I can certainly get better with people. Whereas with a fixed mindset, a lot of people would say, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm just not good with people, period. And they, they believe they can't get good with people. But to me, that's not, 
you know that's not that's not a measure of intelligence because if you are uh, if you have intelligence you would believe in a growth mindset that you can get better with people for instance and please help me welcoming our guest today author of clear closer better how successful people see the world dr emily belchettes hi thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to come onto the show i appreciate having you here Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for that warm introduction. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Like I was talking to you before the show, I feel like I got to know you through the book and the various podcasts and stuff that I've heard you on. So I'm super excited to chat with you. But before we get into this, some of the awesome stuff you talk about in the book, let's learn a little bit more about you. Where did you grow up and what was it like there? I grew up with my uh, my parents, the musicians um, and and educators and therapists. And um, yeah, I, I was it was great. And then I went to college uh, at the University of Nebraska at Kearney in the middle of Nebraska. And so for the first two decades of my life, I was longing to be closer to an ocean. Robert, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be here today. Thank you, Harpreet. That was a, that was one of the best intros I've ever heard. That was great. Thank you, Robert, my man. You absolutely deserve it. So, okay. I'd love to to learn a little bit more about you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about where you grew up, and what was it like there? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I grew up in Los Angeles. Um, I'm 61 years old, so my formative years were really in the 60s. If you go back to 150 years ago, what did people do for entertainment? You know, because, you know, you, you work during the day, you want to have no television. You'd go to the theater, you'd go socialize with friends, you would play cards, you would have, you know, parties or things like that. You would play music in the house. That was how you entertain yourself. But it was like not easy to do, right? And you wouldn't be doing it all the time. So you'd have other time to like, read books or spend time with your children. Suddenly after World War II, the culture industry, the entertainment industry just absolutely exploded. And so we humans now had at our pick and anything we wanted, at our beck and call, we could get any kind of entertainment or distracted which we desired. You know, started with television, sort of exploded it. But look at it now with video games, with there's never a dull moment where your mind isn't filled with the images and products that other people have created invading your mental space, right? Here today, I really appreciate you coming on to the show. Oh, thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Same here. I'm really great place. If you really, if you really find yourself with a lot of time, that's a good place to look. <laughs> Dr. Zoma, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to come on the show today. I really appreciate you being here. Ah, uh, great. Thank you for the opportunity. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Eleanor, I'm so excited to get into some of the stuff we talk about. So, yeah, I'm on all the platforms as and when I think of something useful to say. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. It's been really fun. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for the presentation. I don't know where to hide myself. <laughs> <laughs> no hiding now, Dennis. You are on the Artists of Data Science podcast. Everything will be exposed. So let's... let's, let's <laughs> Let's talk about, just tell us a little bit about where you grew up. Of course. Thank you for having me on, Arpreet. This is a great, great honor. Dude, it is, it is absolutely my honor to, to have you, uh, me being a student at Impact Theory University, having seen you give that presentation on the type of uh, data and analytics work that you do at Impact Theory. Um, I was like, man, I got to get this guy onto the show to, to talk about this, of liminal thinking, the connected company, and game storming, Dave Gray. Dave, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to come on to the show today. I really appreciate having you here. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. That's a long answer to your question, but um, no, absolutely. Liminal thinking is a way is a way of playing with those beliefs and giving yourself uh, a chance to explore them and maybe think twice about them. No, it's absolutely. I absolutely love that. I think it's very applicable for you know my audience, the data scientist, because as an open mindset is really, in my opinion, is, is often characterized and exhibited by a, uh, a voracious curiosity. Uh, you know, people ask me, why do you like being in analytics? Uh, it's one of the only careers where I could, 
you know, when I was working at Dow, be talking to someone about, you know, the flow of oil through a mayonnaise factory in the morning and then in the afternoon, talking to a bank about credit risk. You know, I'm intensely curious about everything. I love, I watched the, the SpaceX launch last night. I love, you know, everything in the world and out of the world too. I, I just want to learn about everything I possibly can. So I think that's an open mindset. That's a curiosity based view of the world. Um, Top voices in data science and AI for 2020, the data science thunder from down under Steve Nori. Steve, my man, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to come onto the show. Uh, awesome. Thank you very much, Harper. It's, uh, it, it was an amazing intro. I just, uh, I'm still um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> super shocked. Uh, the best intro I've ever received, and, uh, and the rhyme was uh, also amazing. I just it love is, it. Thank you. It is absolutely my pleasure, man. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited that you're able to come onto the show. Really excited to, to learn more about you and pick your brain on some topics that I know I'm for sure going to be interested in, and the audience is most definitely going to be interested in as well. To understand who is doing what, if this um, new startup raised some money, I'll try to go to their website and see if they shared any more information about their product and if their product is presentable. Because if this this is something that they don't have any marketing material, then I I cannot just share it. So that's hey, yeah. Jamie Woodhouse. Jamie, thank you very much for taking time out of the schedule to be on the show today. I know it's quite late for you over there in the UK. Yeah, it's a pleasure to talk to you, Harper. Good to be here. So it's interesting to lay out how sentientism can be different from um, some people in the animal advocacy and some people in the animal um, ethics movement, because there are um, many differences of opinion. So some people will say that any sentient being warrants this, exactly the same moral consideration, uh, whether it's a, you know, a chicken or a pig or a horse or a dog or a human being of any, of any type. Um, and they will argue that on the basis that they, they do recognize there are biological differences and probably difference in the quality. Of yeah, and like, you know, but you definitely experience this feeling of this is somehow different from all the other stuff that's going on in the math curriculum. And I, you know, that's something that I think a lot of people say, and that was sort of part of what induced me to center the book around this, this sense that, you know, from writing How Not To Be Wrong, I talked to a lot of people about their experiences in math and, you know, geometry kind of sticks out. It's something that people really remember about math. Thanks for having me. I, you know, I, I think the, uh, the, uh, the intro hyped me up a little too much. You know, I'm just a guy who likes data science, likes making videos on the internet, and just likes talking to people, sharing knowledge and learning stuff. Man, I mean, if, if that, that is very, very true because that authenticity shows through in your videos and the work that you do. And if it was not there, you wouldn't have had that 104,000 subscribers. Congratulations, by the way, on hitting 100K subscribers. I saw you. No, oh, it's my pleasure, Harpreet. Please call me Barb. Oh, definitely Barb. Well, Barb. I was almost belligerent. I was sort of like, you know, I dare yet to try and put it in my brain because my brain just is not going to learn it. And of course, you know, I was not, I didn't want to learn it. And so I was not making it easy. I was one of those just rotten adolescents. And sure. Jane. thanks so much. But what, what a great intro. It, 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 it both got me optimistic and depressed, remembering all the times I've uh, gone broke. Hey, man, so many good lessons that you shared with all of us during and you think about you in the middle of a social graph well until facebook was around nobody had your social graph maybe maybe if the nsa was after you for certain things they might have got it from your metadata and your phone records maybe okay so now every individual i can take you know you and i can compare you to somebody else with the same social graph and i can just move and say, okay, this person saw this ad, went to this location, bought this thing. Now I can put a statistical probability that if you go here, you go to this ad, you go to this location, you're going to do this. Okay. A woman who has helped over 1 million data scientists learn the game and move up the ranks, Lillian <laughs> Pearson. Lillian, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be on the show today. I really appreciate having you here. Great. Thank you so much for 
wow, just have it. Honestly, I, I, I'm really, I feel privileged that you would have me as a guest today. And then you clearly did a lot of homework and that was the most like humbling, I think the biggest the biggest thing is what you just discussed of thinking about thinking that the actual tech part of it is the part that's going to get you ahead. And don't get me wrong. okay? backing up. Let's just back up. Okay, so because this is something that I am just coming to understand or knew now. Um, Time of your schedule to come on to the show today. Thanks so much, Harper. I'm just sitting here smiling because the, the the hype was just wonderful. Uh, I feel like I, I feel like the Chicago Bulls from the 1980s. You know when they would play that song, yeah, and then the guy would like scream, "Michael Jordan!" It, it was a little bit like that, Harper. Oh, I'm awesome. glad. Hey, man. Well, you know what? You I'm, I'm feeling hyped up on a, on a it, Friday morning. Dude, I'm super super excited. <laughs> In order to have a successful networking relationship with me, you have to be comfortable that when I come to you and say, I'm struggling with this, or do you believe this, or I am dealing with this, respond and talk to me about it, you gotta be there. Uh, emails, you know, what is the system you're using to run through that piece? And then the checklist, if you've got, like, for instance, if you're gonna be running your podcast, what are the things that I need to be attending to, you know, in order to set it up and then to follow up with, what's next and you've probably done that otherwise you know you wouldn't be running it successfully so you know and that includes other industries and, and so on but they don't they don't know a thing about your company um unless they've been in there for a long time in which case again they're very valuable to have as part of your requisite variety group but they're not doing all the jobs inside your company they're not dealing directly with the customers every day um they don't have the 25 years of history what we tried back then but I think the key thing I would sort of, it's not what Aristotle said because he wasn't exactly thinking in these terms, but I would like to encourage people to think where they're just performing visible busyness rather than where they're productive. Also, one thing that Aristotle said, if you're always busy working, you never have the time for deep contemplation, which means you never have the time to make the big contributions to society, the big contributions to science, to big contributions to the arts. So you can, you can ask yourself and say, who are the people that you look up to and would they feel this emotion? What would they do? in this situation and then convert it again it just takes practice but those are just some subtle things that you can do to actually change your approach with that if we understand this right most of our emotions are triggered by something that's happened in the past if you take a look at someone says something to you you're most likely going to think of a time that that person said something similar in the past so you're already ready to have those emotions and anytime you have an emotion based on the past you're living in the past personally to me and in my company right now a Data architect is the one that um, thinks up the whole architecture, like they're building the infrastructure, uh, they're planning to build the infrastructure and what services uh, that we would need, but they don't actually implement it. The person that is um, setting up the pipelines, the pipelines are the things that basically deploy the resources. And the future holds of you don't necessarily need to go to college, not saying that you shouldn't. Or, or, or that you should, but you don't. You don't need to go to college. You don't need to be good in school to be successful in life. And I feel like for the longest time, I wasn't good in school. I was in learning center. I couldn't get math. I couldn't retain this type of information. And for the longest time, it made me feel like shit. That this book is amazing. Everybody listening, please pick it up. This is a uh, one of my favorite books for sure. Um, so let's start off talking about what is expertise and why is it so difficult to articulate? So a couple of concepts to unpack there. Um, expertise results from experience. You have to have done it and done a lot of it. The more of it you do, the more expertise you build up. And what's actually happening is you're strengthening various neural connections in your brain, you're growing regions of the brain. You know, it, it's it's easy, as, easy for us to forget, um, you know, what the brain and consciousness and the mind really are all about and how they work. And interestingly, our concept of mind sort of follows along with the the technology of the world at the time so 
HR doesn't do all of that. Sometimes this is under a, a manager's responsibility on how they manage their own team. If they want to promote somebody or fire somebody or hire somebody, they tend to do that themselves. Sometimes they're being helped by HR. But whatever they do, they're really doing it based on all these HR processes, policies, and guidance that they're getting. So they're not just running amok and, you know, offering a 1 million salary to somebody just because they think they can. No, they have to abide by the rules that HR is putting. Tiffany, Hi. thank you so <laughs> like, much for taking I'm time. blushing. I'm blushing. <laughs> <laughs> it's my absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to come on. I remember reaching out to you on LinkedIn. I was like, oh my God, your book is everything. And like I literally meant that it's, it nicely summarizes and encapsulates everything that I've been really interested in over the last two years and a lot of the concepts that have helped shape my current belief system and worldview. So in that sense, your book covers everything that I'm into and I can't wait to uh, to dig into it. Yeah, I, I thought I was the only one that had a crazy journaling habit. So I'm going to... Oh, tell me about okay. yours. Tell me about so yours. There's the six minute journal that I use. Wait, uh, wait, I've never seen a six minute one. Yeah, it's I couldn't five minute. Yeah, I couldn't <laughs> find the uh, five minute journal on the Canadian Amazon, but they had the six minute journal and it's amazing. Like the first almost 70 pages is, is, is almost like a book. And it's, I think you'd really enjoy this. Wow, uh, then, I'm going to order it for research. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good book. I, and, I discovered a lot of um, the habits and just ways of successful people through that. Um, and I've always been super interested in entrepreneurship. So it's always great to hear the advice of those people. Um, I guess a few things that have personally helped me a lot is sleep. I was definitely so sleep deprived throughout high school and college and good sleep really makes a huge difference. Uh, even just like I have red light bulbs in my bedroom or blue light blocking glasses. Um, but to deliberate, like what is the best course of action based on how I'm seeing the truth, how I'm managing my thoughts about it, what should I do? And then finally, the fourth aspect is actually action. Philosophy is not just about thinking, it's about acting and acting it appropriately. And so all those four things, the perception of the truth and the truth, managing your thoughts, being deliberate and acting accordingly, wisdom is the word for all of that. And I would go, oh yeah, okay. Or I would see a system, I go, yeah, these systems are not gonna work together. And you go, yeah, but they really enjoy it. And you go, yeah, but no one cares. So we would be able to complement each other. So knowing who you are, knowing your prima materia, the way things operate is super important. For you, if you go into a company and they are not empathic and they're cutthroat, let's say Wall Street, you probably wouldn't be very happy. Mm -hmm. Right? You'd probably be, oh man, this sucks. They have to, you know, I have to do a transaction that doesn't really work for being empathic with customers. So that's the prime material. It only reads them when they are text PDFs, when a lot of PDFs are image PDFs mm -hmm. of books, you know? Yeah. So I had to like clean all that. And I had like one big function that would just like clean out a lot of common nonsense. And then that did pretty decent. But in, in addition to that, I had a lot of weird, you know, just this word would come out funny in this text. So I had to make like a dictionary, probably like 300, 400 lines long of like, when you see this, fix it to that, you know? Yeah. And that was all like kind of ad hoc as I would see weird stuff come up, I would fix it uh, and go back and like iterate. It's all about just saying, I agree. Yeah, correlation is not causation, but causation is too important to throw out. It's, it's part of how we perceive the universe and how we begin life. You know, from age two or three, we understand the universe in terms of causes and effects. And this, so we, we shouldn't be throwing this out. And, um, and so it's his genius to realize, okay, look, there's something here that's worth preserving. And how can we talk about it? What are the mathematical laws that govern causation? And that's what you'll read about in our book. Language, how, learning how to explain it so that someone coming from another language could understand it and grasp concepts and and grow. Um, so in my case, for me, it's, it's totally, it's absolutely one of the most important skills is communication. Hey. 
What's up, everybody? Welcome to the first artist of data science happy hour of the new year. I want to wish everybody a very, very happy new year. I'm so happy you guys are here. Um, the waiting room is filling up. I'm going to let everybody trickle on in. Thank you guys for joining me. Hope you guys had an amazing holiday season. Yeah, uh, drop me your drop me your email. I'll, I'll send that across oh. to you. I can you drop it, yeah. drop it right here into the into the chat. That way, uh, other people can take a look at it as well. Thank you very much for that, John. And all right, yeah, no problem. Yeah, man, cool. Thank, great, great insightful comment. Thank you, uh, Eric. Cool. Did, that, did that clarify anything for you? Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Cool. Well, yeah, I, would say, I would caveat and say, if you need, if you have an application that requires state, that's where, um, like a stateful logic, that's where you want to use classes. If you don't really care about state and you want things to be immutable. You know, in a truly functional sense, and that's where you would avoid using classes and just use functions. So, yeah. yeah. So, the data engineer, I'm sure that he has, uh, he or she has a particular perception that okay, this guy is doing this sort of work. So, for example, if I'm a data engineer and I've done more of a data analyst kind of work, so is it okay that I write a data analyst on my resume rather than the title given by the company? You can just disc like that's what an interview is for and that's what the resume is for, right? So I mean I wouldn't just make up a job title on your resume, like it's not for that, but you can describe your role, right, on your resume and talk about the work that you did. And then when you're brought into the interview, you can even bring that up as well, right? Because it's not only the material or the lessons of uh, the webinars, but the coaches. Because maybe you can, uh, the, there are different levels inside the bootcamp, so the, the, the learners. So the coaches, I think, are key for for these bootcamps. So I think if for I'll just I'll just echo that and and add that. So data science, right? It's it's much 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 heavier on the science than it is on anything else. Um, the scientific process, you know, being able to uh, sanity check, like gut check, uh, you know, the results that you're coming up with, those skills, uh, you know, you learned uh, through your chemistry uh, career, and those are going to be very valuable. And then, and uh, related to that, coding is not the hardest part of of that to pick up. So um, I agree with with Harp that you know in a couple months you can go from sort of beginner to a pretty pretty proficient coder. Thank you very much. Uh, so so basically what I'm understanding is there's this container all that if you build app you put it in this container and this container is actually flexible and portable in any environment that you put into. Correct? I, I just I, I just want to know the high level. That's it. And, and I, I, because if they're going to dig me, <laughs> dig more into it, I don't know. I'm going to just say, I don't know, but I just want to just get a basic level. So this container can move around different premises. It's portable and everything's packaged in. It could be, so these apps can be written in different languages and so forth, but they are- Classmate. Well, I don't know if it's great, but it's certainly my advice. That's for sure. Um, so Megan, the first thing, I'm going to, I'm going to key off something you said and tell me if I'm over indexing on this. I picked up on this idea of- So that's the other piece that I would um, think about it coming from a different perspective of someone not doing it, but having someone else do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go on, man, we go. Yeah, I wanted to, I just wanted to chime in on that with uh, Austin, uh, Giovanna and Eric. I'm, I'm currently in a boot camp as well. I'm at the tail end of a, of a Flatiron data science program. And uh, one of the big reasons I ended up jumping in there is um, exactly like y'all are saying. One, network. Two, you know. I love the Python and R debate. I actually um, started off in R, and that's only because the group that I was doing a rotation with, they were using R. Um, but to Dave's point, they didn't really interact with any of the software engineers or anything like that. They just did their analysis within the group. So R was something that worked well for them. LinkedIn looks at people is based on how much time they can get others to spend on platform. Like that's one of their major metrics is how much time any individual gets other individuals to spend on platform. And so that's, you know, all the metrics around that 
if you're posting frequently, if you do blogs, if you do something like that on LinkedIn, you're all going to, you know, you're going to see more engagement allowed and you're going to see more of sort of a latitude because they know you're not a bot and you're there to help sort of your goals align with the platform's goals. So LinkedIn is not that different from other social networks, right? So you can, when you think about metrics, you can kind of think about it sort of piecewise, right? So one feature LinkedIn has is the uh, feed, the newsfeed feature, right? It's going to have very, very similar metrics to what Facebook does. Sorry to disappoint that Harpreet is not here today. Well, all right. <laughs> oh, good. I've been absent for, for weeks, so he, he gets a one free pass. Yes, he's, he said he misses us though. So. In honor of data though, I had to do the the rubber ducky debugging. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <It's on> <laughs> Hello everyone. I am not Harpreet. Despite despite you might think, oh I know, a lot of you guys look shocked, huh? I, I shaved my beard and this is what Harpreet looks like with a shaved beard. A, uh, Just kidding. My name's Avery. Shirt, I'm so, one of Harpreet's uh, friends. Good stuff. Yeah. I had to I had to I had to fit in. I know I can't be wearing a shirt. He's always wearing the nice Hawaiian shirts and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the best way to break into research is to break into research. Now I'm gonna give you some wisdom from reinforced learning. Reinforced learning, an agent in reinforced learning, starts out with an initial policy. That initial policy is crap. Your initial break into research plan might be crappy. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think I wasn't really asking about like breaking into it, but that's like, that's a big beast for sure. But I, I think, I think our community is super tight. And so like you're saying, like if you do big projects, like usually, Usually there's someone with an opening on some team at some point that'll help you at least get in in the production space. Oh, you're smiling. I can't tell if you agree or not, but like... Yeah. Would you also would you also talk in terms of their actual sort of money value? I, if you do that in 10 hours and you do that now in five hours, you'd save X amount, for example, or things that are where they can actually... Okay, fine. Business process is not always easy to say, right, yeah, if I do that in half of... Basically, it's either reduction in time. Week where I am supposed to organize all the thoughts we discussed in the last hour in a 30 minute case study. Um, and that's with a finance team. So I like that this time I'm making an impact in the finance, which is actually driving the business. Um, so the role is more focused on internal controls, and I am tasked with identifying different processes stakeholders, risks within the organization, and then coming up with a framework that's going to be built from scratch and pushed upwards to different levels. It says, but apparently LinkedIn content creators are going to start to make money. I don't know when um, and how much, but it seems like, you know how, um, what do you call it? TikTok is paying their content creators after you hit a certain number of subscribers. Um, yeah, it sounds like LinkedIn is going to start doing something like that, but also you'll be able to get hired by brands to promote content. So I think they're working on a new feature like that. That's about this issue that what was it, the billion hours of YouTube watched a year was a big KPI they were chasing. And there's a lot of evidence that they basically they drove all kinds of horrifying content to make that happen over time. And like now, everyone is realizing what they've done and we're all trying to clean up the mess. But I think we're pretty far from really defining what ethical policies the tech industry should have to deal with this kind of content. It's, yeah, it's one of the problems of our- I know there's some people who post content on YouTube, on LinkedIn here. And the one thing I've seen, so I started posting content and I really want to uh, give back. I started by going back to my college and because my professor invited me. But then I saw some repeating questions, so I just decided to start posting on stuff. And I, I see some good good engagement, which I'm happy about, right? Um, I am not looking to like make it big like Harpreet. I mean, he's world famous, but... I think you started to address what I was going to say right here at the end. It's just, you look at the population of... Like, how many actual data scientists are there out there? And then how many of those are on LinkedIn looking to talk to each other or on YouTube looking to talk to each other and learn from each other? Let's go.
uh, towards data science. And uh, one of the things, the obvious thing is actually practicing uh, the theory. Um, here I'm struggling a little bit. Uh, I want to say probably with my motivation uh, because uh, whenever I'm trying to think about a project that I want to do, uh, it normally goes above my skill set, so obviously I tend not to finish it. It's an exception, so I had a role one time where the title the company gave had nothing to do with what we were actually doing. And so my resume, based on what I knew about the industry, I put what that title probably should have been. And so uh, just keep that in mind. You're not beholden to somebody else's moniker, uh, especially if it doesn't match the actual function. This is also super true in like certain industries like consulting where your title will be associate. And that will be 50 jobs under that title. And you're just like, okay, I have to self-label here because also associate is junior in some places. Any random round? Question one, can, can, you give us a, can you give us a rhyme real quick? Right off, <laughs> top, right off the top of the dome. Yo, I'm doing this off the top of the dome. You see me, I'm Jeff Lee. Our preach wearing that black sweater. You know it says coffee. You see me right here hitting on that line. You look at me, you know, and I be hitting on another rhyme. You see, I see that bird in the sky. I'm flying. Oh, machine learning models, data science. Oh, you see, I hit it, another rap session. Oh, I got a good RMSC linear regression. Yo, I'm doing this off the top of the dome. You see me. It. I'm Jeff Lee. It's, got, it's got that proper East Bay, Northern California swag. <laughs> you know, Thank you. Problem. Appreciate it. <laughs> to predicting turnover in a certain in a certain company, and really, so as as we're talking about it, you know, building building the model, we've discussed that it's important that we use the data that we have ethically, you know, and maybe there are certain categories of data that we just don't use. Um, because sure it's available, but just because we can doesn't necessarily mean we should. And then the other piece is once the model is in existence now, is the model going to be used or applied elsewhere for other purposes? Kind of like, you know, what we're saying. it's like, is it created to track progress? And then is it then turned to say, oh, well, we know that these kinds of people are going to turn over, therefore we're going to be biased in our hiring process against these kinds of people. We're not going to hire, you know, and it just... Well, I was thinking about um, just, especially with COVID happening and stuff, I've seen a lot of people like just on social media and stuff like that, getting some data stuff like really wrong. Um, so something I've been thinking about this week is like, how do you, how do you handle those people? I mean... I mean, sure, there's like people at jobs and things like that that you have to like describe data things to um, that are not data people. But Certainly if there's willing to, to change with the advent of new information. Uh, what I find far more difficult is the, the willful ignorance or willful stupidity or willful bias or prejudice. Tons, like everybody's an expert right now. Everybody has an opinion and I think that um, you have to keep it to yourself most of the times, but if not, you know, like Joe say, um, you have uh, uh, you have to pick your battles. And um, you know, like uh, I, I think the whole the whole thing of saying uh, this is interesting. <laughs> I just found it, um, you know, very useful. It's just oh, this is interesting, and just talk about something else.